Hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Medina. Thank you for joining us here today on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. For those of you who don't know, my name, my name is Daniel Medina. I've been with Investors Advantage for going on 14 years now. And we're going to start here by going over our homepage. Just in case you haven't been here, we got some stuff going on. On the top right hand corner, you'll see a webinars page. This is where we post all of our future and previous webinars. You can always RSCP here for the next one or see our past webinars going back for a few months now. Also, in the center of the page, you'll see news interviews. Make sure you check these out because we post all of John's interviews, some of which have up to 150,000 views. Most recently, John was on TD Ameritrade. And one last thing on the home page, the avoid the financial pandemic button. This is our one two punch. We'll send this out after the webinar, but make sure you take a minute here to watch our video and get your risk number just in case you haven't done it before. This is a great tool that we use just for our financial planning. And now I'll introduce John Grace, president and founder. President and founder. Thanks, Daniel. So good that y'all could join us today and uh, living in America these days, right? I mean, I just have to tell you, this is uh, between the uh, police and the COVID-19 for some of us, it's quite the scary time. I think, in fact, it's probably pretty scary for all of us, but I must say for some of us, it's a little bit more scary because uh, they're very difficult uh, situations to try to navigate and negotiate. I do really, uh, I'm really glad that uh, youth joined us last week where we had some numbers and, and they came up with some questions. So we've worked that into the conversation today. Uh, your questions, by the way, give us guidance as to the material that we will cover. Uh, and today we're going to spend a, a good amount of time really uh, working with Patrick Gara, who is representative of one of the companies that, uh, you know, sometimes there are a lot of companies that spend a lot of money to make sure you recognize their name. And that's very expensive real estate when they put their name in your head and you can come up with it, all right? But we find that um, in many cases, we, there are companies where they have great name recognition and yet the work that they do is, well, ordinary, not uh, exceptional. We strive for being exceptional. We strive to be above average. And so we're gonna talk about why we work with some companies that don't have the same name recognition as others. And of course, you know who pays for that, right? Uh, and talk about how some take advantage of technology that others haven't. And in fact, are still saying the same thing that we were taught when we got our first securities license 20, 30, 40 years ago in my case. Uh, and in many of my peers, in the case of many of my peers, we might have been in the business 40 years, but frankly, we've repeated the first year 40 times. That's not how we roll. I want you to know that, but that is how most of our peers roll. So uh, let's, let's dive in and let me uh, come up with a I thought it was a great quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower. We're going to, you know, talk about uh, the, uh, the topic is, um, is prepare your portfolio for two second waves, not one, but two. We'll get into the details. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the first one. In fact, what are we on lockdown in California right now? 70%. Uh, that's always fun. And then, uh, you know, so we'll get into the details and then our attorneys want to make sure that you see this particular piece of information that, that you have available. Uh, and then this is our agenda. We're going through the introduction. We'll talk about how you can prepare your portfolio for two second waves. Uh, we, we think in terms of preparing for the good, the bad, and the unforeseen, all right? We think there are ways to do that. You don't have to see the future to prepare for the future. That's, that to our way of thinking is very important. And we'll talk about investing with confidence and we'll open up for questions and answers. And let me say again, we really appreciate your questions. Uh, because that means we have to come up with good answers. And as I say, uh, you cause us to look forward in terms of what do we need to cover next? Uh, and that's really how we're getting involved with uh, today. So here we are, um, July 1, happy uh, Independence Day. Uh, and we've all got to wear a mask, right? <laughs> and you know, isn't it funny, at least it is to me, that um, masks have become a political statement? You know, I like to compare and contrast. And when we look at other countries, that's not what's happening in other countries. They may not want to wear them, but it didn't become a battering ram that you're either politically correct or you were weak. Uh, you know, they just didn't roll like that. Uh, 
living here in America. All of a sudden, we've had the last five, six months, it's become a very political statement uh, to wear a mask or not wear a mask. But I, I think that's bizarre because at the end of the day, it's all about health, whether it's financial health or our mental health or our physical health. And let's get started with uh, a, a quote we pulled from uh, uh, 34, 34th President, five-star general Dwight D. Eisenhower. As we peer into society's future, we, that would be you and I, and our government must avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow, which I think is where we are today. So if we look at what's happened happening recently, as of yesterday, stocks rallied into the close uh, Tuesday, yesterday, to cap off the best second quarter for blue chip equity since the S&P 200, I'm sorry, 500, was created in 1957. The best quarter since it was created, 1957. We saw the S&P surge at about 20% for, for April through June quarter uh, in a swift rebound from the index's March lows as a historic infusion of fiscal and monetary stimulus to prop up, emphasize prop up, individual, business, and the economy undercut concerns over the coronavirus spread. The advance marked the index's best overall quarter since 1998. You see the Dow jumped more than 17 and percent and the NASDAQ outperformed with a greater than 30% gain for the second quarter, making these indices best overall quarter since 1987 and 2001 respectfully. Now we talked about uh, the uh, inequality in terms of wealth and income. And, and some of the questions came up, so we want to dig a little deeper because I thought this was a good graph to help explain some of what we were covering just last week. You've heard uh, so many proclaim, or certainly uh, one individual claim, this was the best economy ever. And you heard me talk about my experience with those who use words like that on uh, Fox television and how that's really what they're selling. I doubt that they really believe it, but the numbers do not support that statement. I don't care who says it, the numbers just don't support the statement. It, 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 the statement is perfectly fine if you're in the top 20%, but for the rest of us, not so much. So, you know, certainly for uh, the top 1%, best economy ever, hands down, I, I agree 100%. But not so much for middle income and not so much for minorities. Uh, while the stock market is a form for, it is far from a guarantee for getting rich, uh, the equity market's capacity to help savers accumulate wealth through long-term diversified investing is well documented. Over the past 20 years, the S&P 500 index of large U.S. stocks has generated about a 6% annual return, a return that would turn about, would return $500 of monthly investment into more than $20,000 of additional wealth before taxes in 10 years, compared to keeping that money in a no interest checking account. So it has performed rather well. But when we look at African Americans, for example, we are far less represented when it comes to financial asset holding, as you can see in this, in this chart. Most folks have their, a lot of their financial holdings in retirement accounts. Uh, and about 30% uh, of the black households in the US have retirement accounts compared with around 60% of whites, as you can see here. The disparities between black and white households, financial assets, are even greater than they are for other important sources of wealth, like housing and vehicles. This comes from the Federal Reserve. I think that's a, a, you know, a, a good source. And then it gets a little more interesting because rich families, and nobody thinks they're rich, by the way, uh, have the biggest share of the stock market pot. The wealthiest 10% of US households owned about 83% of those holdings. That's a, as of 2016, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis. Let's dig a little deeper and we see that, this we talked about last week, the income differential. In 1970, the average household income was less than $10,000, about $9,807, but for, Black households, the income was about $6,500. Uh, 
That's a difference of about 35%. And we all wanna believe we've made so much progress. But when we look at the numbers today, we see the average household income of 2019 is about $66,500. I think that's actually updated through 2020. And yet the average income for Latinos is 51,000 and for black Americans about $40,000. So if we go back to that metric in terms of what the difference is when it comes to white America versus black America, it's about 30, 35%, no difference. That's 50 years where we thought we had made so much progress. And yet when we bothered to do the math, we can see despite the hyperbole, the data does not demonstrate this has been the best economy for all of us. And of course, as far as I'm concerned, I want it to be the best economy for every American, no matter where you come from if you're here. I want us all to feel that and know it happens for us too. Now, if we go a little bit further, Let's look at the share of households with uh, indirect stock ownership. And we find that uh, about 62% of, uh, of uh, black households with college graduate head of households own about, uh, you know, that's about 62% of the stock owned by black head of households where there's a college graduate. With no college degree, it's, it's down to 31%. And for white households with a college graduate head of household who own stock, it's about 86%. And then when we look at those without college degrees, it's about 56% own stock in America. So while the deep imbalances persist, stock market is in some respects easier than ever. Thanks to financial apps, millions of people can buy shares of America's most promising companies using the phones they already carry in their pockets, right? But the stock market's wealth generation will remain out of reach if inequalities in the job market and other parts of society aren't identified and rectified. To see the problem or to deal with the problem, we have to see the problem. And then we can figure out what to do with it, okay? So, you know, let's look at uh, one of the waves that I'm most concerned about. You, you're aware of the coronavirus wave. Uh, but here's one that uh, you probably haven't heard of. And I think you're going to hear of uh, as we go along because it's, uh, it's right around the corner. It's something called leveraged loans. Leveraged loans. The loans have more leverage applied to them to try to boost the returns. So these are loans made to companies already in trouble on leverage, borrowed money. Hence, they are worse than high yield bonds which are made to companies with low credit ratings. The, the, the credit of the Federal Reserve, the central banks around the world have kept interest rates at the lowest we've ever seen. And what they're doing is really pumping up the economy so that it appears as though everything is going along just fine. But we all know, even seven-year-olds know that when you keep adding air to the balloon, the bigger the bubble the bigger the burst. And that's what we're concerned about is how big that burst might become. I think it could be pretty ugly. So when we look at the loans, they have exploded about 2.1 times or 112% from 2.6 trillion at the top of the last boom in 2007 to five and a half trillion dollars today. The global, see, because we're all doing the same thing. Governments are doing it. Corporations are doing it, consumers are doing it. We're all trying to put duct tape on a problem and make the problem just disappear like magic. And of course we know there's, there's no such thing. So the global total of leveraged loans plus high yield bonds also rose 2.1 times since 2007 from about 3.8 trillion to oh, about exactly, well, to exactly $8 trillion at this time. Uh, these business loans and bonds are the ones most likely to trigger the next large wave of debt and bond defaults during a boom in which corporate debt rose the fastest, not consumer and financial sector debt like last time. So this one's going to be different, but it's all about the debt. It's just not so much the consumer debt that is so problematic. It's the corporate debt that we believe is very problematic. So let's look at the kind of a some of the words that you don't hear about, that you're going to hear about. You might remember that the last time around, uh, we were looking at uh, collateralized debt obligations, okay? Uh, well, that's what's going on now. Last time it was collateralized loan obligations.
applications. But you know, whenever you're using a term, right, and you don't understand it, it's prob it could be very problematic. So what we're seeing here in the blue is the, the, uh, the structured finance vehicles and the collateralized debt obligations in green are similar and totaled 760 billion in 2007. The collateralized loan obligations in the red were up to 680 billion as of 2019. Now, all of these leveraged loan packages dressed up to look like A plus rated bonds are at 871 billion versus one over a trillion dollars in 2007. China and the global real estate bubble are the epicenter of this unprecedented bubble, which also includes the greatest stock market bubble in history. It's just that stock crashes don't cause the debt deleveraging problems that real estate and business loans do. But, you know, once you lose your percentage, you're, you're, that, you're just down. But the percentage that you lost wasn't compounded by the money that you borrow. Okay, so we think of things differently. Um, and uh, that's what we want to say here, that you know, this isn't our first time at the rodeo. And as I say, most of our uh, peers do things uh, very much the same. Uh, we like to look at things differently. And one of the reasons we can is because since 1999, we began paying for independent research to the tune of about $10,000 a year. Now, I don't know if you've ever paid for independent research. I doubt that you know of another financial advisor who has, by the way. Please ask them, did they pay for it? Not did the firm pay for it? Because you have to recognize who's making what statement and who are they representing or what are they representing? If I'm Larry Kudlow and I'm representing the president, I certainly have an agenda to make my boss happy and keep my job and stick around. If I represent uh, one of the larger firms where we might be in real estate or we might uh, underwrite stock or we may offer mutual funds or exchange traded funds, when, so, when is it not a good time to buy stock? It's always a good time if you have some money, right? That would be our typical answer. And, and we're going to suggest that that's not always true. And sometimes we can, as I say, prepare for the future without having to try and predict it. So we, we know that we, we are all in this together, but the recession isn't hitting us all equally. And if you haven't noticed, by the way, we're in a full-blown recession. Now, let me spend a moment there. Um, you know, as I say, this isn't our first time to the rodeo. Uh, and we're not practicing learning how to shave on your face. <laughs> All right? So by paying for the research and recognizing what we could have learned in 1987, and then in 2000, and then notice in the same decade, there was a debacle of another 50% loss, according to Yahoo Finance, around 2008 and fourth quarter 2018. What have we learned? What have we been able to come to you, the investor, to say, here's how you might be better prepared? Because one of the things that has uh, become very clear to, to Daniel and me is that the savvy investors we have the pleasure of working with genuinely hate losses more than they love gains. So for our way of thinking, to do a better job, we don't think it's appropriate for us to come to you and say, sit and take it, buy and hold, hold and hold. No, we think we're better off coming to you and say, let's figure out what kind of loss you can accept. I don't expect you to know the answer, but we'll help you get that answer. And that's what Daniel was talking about. And it'll be sent to you for you to figure it out. And if you want us to walk you through the part where you fill in the questions, let us know. We're happy to do that over the phone so that you can get the answer that I don't think you You've been able, you've been asked before, how much loss can you accept? And then how can you design the portfolio? So that it might just perform within your parameters, not the market's parameters. In other words, when we're talking with clients and uh, you know, early this year, market was down, what was it, 23, 30%, but our clients were off maybe 10 or 11%. They get that, <laughs> they get that, wow, it's not as bad. I wish it wasn't down at all. But you know, if I'm down 10, what do I need, 12 or so to get back even? If I'm down 30, Daniel, the math man, would help us recognize, now I need a 50% gain just to get back to even. And heaven forbid I'm down 50 or 60%, we have the numbers for you, it counts down 
we need 100%, most people's answer would be 50%. It's 100% that we need to get back to even. And at one, at 60%, now it's 160% that we need to get back to even. So it, with all of the you know, great information about how well the market has done, let's recognize that right now, uh, the only index that's in positive territory would be the NASDAQ. We left a little earlier after the close, and NASDAQ year to date is up about 13 and a half percent. However, the S&P is off about three, a little 3.3 percent year to date from January 1 through today. And the Dow, despite all of these magnificent gains, is off still about nine and a half percent. We're saying to you that there's something wrong here, something that we need to be prepared for. And, and let, me, let me put a little reset in here because we talked about some of those numbers in terms of uh, 1970. Roughly $10,000 was the average household income. And in 1970, I was fortunate enough to be able to buy a brand new Toyota Corolla. That it was a 71. Never even seen it before, but it was on the inside of the showroom and I was able to secure that car with a 50% down because I was a good saver. And, and by the way, the payments on that loan were $38.43 a month. That wasn't the tax, that was the payment. So here's my point. If the average household income was $10,000, as a, the Census Bureau asserts it was in 1970, and a, it's a new car, but not a very nice car, Toyota Corolla, was $2,000, as a percentage of income, that's what, 20%? And here we are with the average household income being at an all-time high of $66,500. If you apply the 20% that it used to take to buy a car to $66,500, of that number is about $13,000. So the question that begs to be asked is what kind of new car can you buy with $13,000? Not much, used car, sure, not a new one. So what it begins to help us be able to see is to, to maintain the same ability to buy the same uh, you know, kind of car or class of car, if you will. Right now, cars, new cars are between 20, 25 to $30,000. So that would suggest just to maintain the same standard of living without taking into account inflation and taxes. It used to be $10,000, 20% is $2,000. Today, to keep that 20 to 30% of your earned income um, in uh, compliance would mean that you need to be making, your family needs to be making, $100,000 to $125,000 a year. It doesn't matter if it's one or two households. You, to be in the same condition we were 50 years ago at 10, we now to be, need to be north of $100,000 a year. How many people can say that? So not many. <laughs> Remember, the average household income is, is 66.5. And interestingly enough, the, the folks uh, for uh, Caucasians, I believe that's annual household income on average about 70,000. And for Asian Americans, I believe the average household income uh, from Pew Research is about uh, $87,000. So this whole notion of you know, doing the math and budgeting and maybe spending more time in math class and science is probably a good idea for us Americans to embrace because you know, things can change drastically so very quickly. And, and we don't want your lifestyle to, to, to take a turn for the worse. We want you to be able to uh, figure out when you wanna make work optional, spend the next 20, 30 years, um, not having to work at all unless you choose to, but the finances are there so that you can afford to have the same kind of income showing up every month as though you were working for that income. So the question becomes for most of us, you know, how much money do we need behind door number one to have the same income after our last paycheck without having to work? And for those of us who've achieved whatever level of financial independence or asset gathering that we're going to um, accumulate, now the question becomes, how much loss can you accept as you're taking withdrawals? Because if the loss is uh, too high on top of the withdrawal, it's like you're, you're in a hole and all you can do is you feel like you keep digging the hole, which of course is not what you want to do. So that's why we brought uh, Patrick Gara into the equation. And let's see if I can get my lights turned back on over here. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Daniel and I. Um, he's uh, been in the business 
uh, helping financial advisors manage uh, their business and with good ideas and creative concepts for about uh, 15 years. I believe he's been with Asset Mark for about 13 years. And, and it's interesting that he was a licensed private banker as well as a uh, sales consultant to a large insurance company. Some of those names probably we would recognize. He's now working with uh, Asset Mark uh, and he's working on his CFP designation. Now, what I want to call your attention to is I love having a conversation with a client just earlier today where we became a client in 1986. And at that time, the only thing we had available to us were mutual funds. And a lot of those mutual funds have done a great deal of advertising, right? So it's fascinating to me that some people think they know the company because they keep advertising, but they never meet anybody from the company. And truthfully, the, 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 the way that they do business is in a very passive fashion. In other words, it, it's 100% stocks, no matter the fund, if it's a stock portfolio. And that portfolio, in many cases, mirrors the S&P, which means it mirrored the S&P off 37% uh, or more, like in 2008, uh, and then mirrored the S&P with a 25% gain maybe in 2009. Uh, but what we want are the companies, regardless of how well or how much they might advertise, we want to uh, you know, keep your assets intact. So in other words, what we were doing with clients where we were in these kinds of structures in 2008, instead of being off 37, 40, sometimes 50%, our clients in these active management portfolios were off 20% or less. The math is if we're off 20% or less, we need no more than 25%. If it's as much as 20%, we need no more than 25% to get back even. But as we discussed a little bit earlier, if for whatever reason, that loss becomes more severe, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. Now you need a Hail Mary pass just to get back to even. And let's be clear, if you don't need the money, it really doesn't matter what the market does. It doesn't matter. Or you have a whole, or you have a lot of time to recover. It's when you do need the money that it matters. And it's when you may not have the kind of time that you used to have to recover where it really begins to matter. So what we're saying is we want to do what we can to limit our losses so we do not need a Hail Mary pass or you know a home run just to try to, to get back in the game. So I, I love, I uh, had a chance to be on a, on a program like this with uh, Peter Lynch and um, enjoyed every minute of it in Boston. This is a long time ago, but uh, you know, he says, you need to know what you're doing with your money and, and know how it's doing. So <laughs> Patrick, take it from there and give us some concept please, because I talk in the big picture, I want you to drill down a bit if you would to look at some of the positions that, for example, were 100% invested in equities in early November, but all in cash by late November. How is it that that is done? And how is that different than, than market time? That's good. Thanks, John. Um, and Daniel's going to go ahead and share some slides. I'm going to start, you know, just my agenda for today is to talk a little bit about who asset market is because uh, a lot of times the actual the end investor doesn't really see our name you know we do not sell to retail clients we only work through advisors so we're not a name brand that's out there in the in the in the marketplace i'll talk about where are our asset marks investment beliefs and where they come from and then i'm going to end with a couple examples and then we'll open up for q a uh so you know next slide daniel so Asset Mark has been around for over 20 years. Uh, we were actually started by financial advisors that were looking for a way to better manage and run more efficient businesses. Um, the, you know, we have a little over, as of the beginning of uh, 2020, we had a little over $60 billion in assets. We're, one the, we're the second largest uh, third-party asset management platform in the industry uh, with over 7,000 advisors that are currently working with us. Now, the reason advisors like John and others work with our platform uh, is you know shown here on this page. And we provide a range of investment solutions, which I'll, get, our, I'll cover in a uh, couple slides from now. Uh, we offer complete wealth management capability. So, you know, and what that means is not just your, you know, mutual fund and ETF type strategies, but we do offer customized high net worth options. We offer trust services, donor advised fund capabilities. We even offer retirement plans for small business owners and securities backed lending capabilities. So. As our platform has grown, we've offered more and more solutions to help advisors run their practices more effectively. Uh, and then the main reason that I hear that advisors work with our platform is our due diligence. 
the one of the main things that we do at Asset Mark is we've got a team of, of analysts that in order to bring in investment platform or investment strategy onto our platform to, for advisors to use, they go through a very thorough deep dive from our analyst team to understand the people, philosophy, organization, and process. Not only do they go through that upfront, but then ongoing, we continue to monitor them to make sure that there's been no changes, to make sure the, the portfolio manager is still managing to the objectives that they stated. Uh, and we're one of the, the rare strata or platforms out there that will actually terminate relationships if needed. Um, you know, and that, that comes to, you know, portfolio managers change. There are, there are challenges that happen. Um, maybe their strategy isn't working, you know, based on the current market scenario. Our team is constantly monitoring to that and then providing that information down to John. So whether we make the decision to terminate a, real, terminate a relationship or John is able to make a change to for your client or for your portfolios, we give him as much data and advice so that he's able to make the best decisions for you. Uh, next slide, Daniel. So I'm going to start with saying, you know, we understand at Aston Mark that investments can mean different things to different people. Uh, it can be a secure retirement, it can be college tuition funding, it could be purchasing a new home, or many other options. But we also understand that human emotions can get in the way of working toward long-term goals. Um, when markets are volatile, especially, this is a great time to mention this, you know, look at this year, you know, emotions can get involved and, it, and the end investor can find, you know, can look to make changes to their plan that, do, that may not work with what their long-term goals are. Now at Asimark, we feel that we've got an approach that can help you stay invested while also uh, and help you achieve your goals by not making changes, you know, mid-cycle. Next slide, please. So I think this is a really important chart because what we're talking about here is, I don't know any investor that doesn't know that in order to get long-term growth and achieve their goals, they know they need to have equities in their portfolio. However, what we're seeing here is, you know, you see the spike in 2008 or early 2000s and then again in 2008. It's the upside is great. It's when you see those downturns, when the markets start to get volatile, that's what, you know, down 44%, down 51%, and this is the S&P 500. We understand that we need to stay invested over the long term, but when your portfolio is showing down 20, 30, 50%, emotions start to take over and you know, decisions start to be made that may not be, like I said, in, you know, in accordance with your plan. Next slide, please. And this is, you know, kind of, you know, many have seen this, uh, this chart here. What it's showing is that we want to buy more and we tend to want to add more to our portfolios when the market's good and when everything's going great, that's when we buy. And at the end, we, we tend to sell when we're panicking. It's after the panic, it's after doubt. Now just think back to how your portfolios have handled the past few years. You know, the fourth quarter of 2018, where we saw a lot of volatility come ro uh, you know, roaring back into the marketplace, or even the beginning of this year. Uh, even the beginning of this year, you know, you started to see some, you know, some really strong buying signs in January and early February, and then it quickly eroded away. Coronavirus pandemic cut kicks in, economy starts to shut down. And we actually, you know, we, we started to see a lot of clients wanting to move their portfolios to cash towards the end of March. Um, that, you know, we would argue is probably the worst time to make that decision because you're selling at the bottom. You're selling when, you know, you feel that there's no more hope. So we feel that, you know, I'm going to get into some slides that show why we feel we can do something different that allows you to stay invested. Next slide, please. Now this, what we're looking at here is the growth of the S, you know, if you had invested in the S&P 500 since February, uh, December 2006, so right at the end, beginning of 2007, right before the financial, mark, uh, financial crisis hit and stayed invested, if you had a million dollars invested solely in the S&P 500, by the end of 2019, your portfolio would have grown to $3 million. You would have tripled, tripled your value. However, we understand this is not the case of the average investor emotions like i said come into play and when they made when we saw the most amount of sales or uh sales out of equities into cash or fixed income was right toward the tail end right around april uh march april 2009 right went right before the market bottomed Client, uh, investors would sit out of the market and the you know the phrase you would hear is i don't i want to wait until you know markets start to calm down until things get a little bit more normal before i buy back in 
Well, by that time, it was after two, you know, the, it was mid 2010. The markets had come back up to right about where we were at the peak. And then that chart there shows you how much you could erode from your value just by making a decision at the wrong time, waiting until the markets calm down again before buying back in. Next slide, Daniel. So the next couple of slides I'm going to talk about is, you know, just a little bit of, his, of history on asset allocation. Now, asset allocation, going back into the 80s, is really about trying to diversify your risk, you know, so you're not just in equities and fixed income. So back in the 80s, it was literally stocks and bonds. But as time evolved, asset allocation, just, you know, in order to provide upside while limiting downside, portfolios started to get more robust and more diverse. We added in uh, international stocks and international bonds. And then in the 2000s, we added in emerging markets and high yield fixed income. Then we added in real estate and commodities. So that's where we're, that's where we're at up until the last decade, adding more asset classes, diver further diversifying to try to protect, you know, so that no one place of your portfolio is performing in line with others. But, you know, if you go to the next slide, Daniel, what you'll see is what happened in 2008 what happened when it was when the market started to fall, when the U.S. equities fell in 2008 uh, into the beginning of 2009, not only did U.S. equities fall, international equities fell more, high yield bonds started, you know, were falling, REITs, commodities, they were all falling. What this started to look like is our portfolios were not as diverse as we thought they were when everything starts to go down at the same time. As much as we added in to build our portfolios to protect against this loss, it didn't work. So what Asimark started to do is come up with a strategy that allows for different ways of managing money and using different asset allocation pie charts uh, in order to better diversify. It's taking the next level. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. So we came up with this, uh, this uh, concept called investing and evolved. It's the next step in building a diverse asset allocation. We talk about core market strategies. Uh, that's you know that's a that's the area that you're going to spend have the bulk of your portfolio in, and I'll get a little bit more in detail as to what they do. But those are your traditional asset class exposures, like the pie charts we saw before. It's going to have your your equities, your bonds, your real estate, your commodities. Uh, whether it's active or passively managed, the goal main goal of those strategies is to capture the market returns, whether that be up or down. Then you talk about tactical strategies. We've segmented them into two subclasses of enhanced return and limit loss. These tactical strategies you can add in as a supplement. They're not as large of an allocation, uh, but they have the ability to make decisions more on a, a based on data, not emotion, to either add additional risk in your portfolio if your goal is to uh, grow faster or provide strategies that will reduce your risk in your portfolio based on what's going on in the current market environment. And then the third uh, section is diversifying strategies. These help manage around those risks of equities. Um, when markets start to really sell off like we saw in March or like we saw in the end of 2018, these portfolios can actually move very quickly away in different directions and try to take advantage of those downward markets. So we add those in as well as tactical bond strategies. Now there's an analogy that we like to use on our platform. Um, it's, you know, we, it's referring to a car. Right, so when you drive your car, you don't just drive with your gas pedal, right? You want your gas pedal, you want your steering wheel, and you want your brake. The main thing that we talk about with Asimark is having those three components when you're going, you know, and tying that into an investment landscape. So the core market strategy, that's your gas pedal. That's going to get you going, going down the highway. Uh, the more you press down, the more risk you take, the faster you go. The more you let off, you know, the, the, you know, the slower you go but that's gonna control you how, you know, how you're traveling down the road. However, we know that there's gonna be time that there's another car in the way, there's, other, there's something that comes up in our way. If we didn't have a steering wheel, we wouldn't be able to get up to make those changes and make tactical moves to the vehicle in order to avoid it. That's what the tactical strategy is. Think of that as your steering wheel. And then the brakes, think of that as your diversifying strategies. You, know, you, hope, you, you hope that you don't need them, uh, or you, you use them when you need to, but you, when, you know, when there's something that stops right in front of you, you want to make sure that your brakes are strong and that are going to do a good job to help avoid a catastrophic event. So that's, a, that's one of the analogies that we use at Asimark to talk about our strategies. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Daniel. Actually, we can skip probably the next three. All right. 
So in, in finalization, looking at these portfolios, how do they work? How does this concept work in the long term? This is three examples of three different risk profiles, a moderate conservative, a moderate portfolio, and then a moderate aggressive portfolio. Factoring in uh, the, the, the different strategies here, the, the, the gas, the brake, and the steering wheel, your global blend, the blue bar there, that is just a traditional core only strategy. That's all that's doing is that's your gas pedal only in this uh, 20 year period ending in 2019, while the green bars are factoring in those tactical decisions and those diversifying decisions and how they're able to provide additional return over time by bringing those, uh, those categories in. Next slide, Daniel. And then and, you know, finalizing just our asset mark philosophy, this is a, you know, just an easy way to glance at when these different strategies work. Equity alternatives work really strong when the markets are volatile. Um, bond alternatives, those are designed to be different than just your traditional fixed income portfolio that stays in, uh, in, stays in corporate bonds or something like that. It's designed to make changes, and I'm going to cover it an example there. The tactical limit loss strategy, when markets get, you know, start to sell off, these are strategies that have the ability to go from 100% equities to a 100% cash position based on data. Um, there's a number of different, we work with a few different providers, and they all have different reasons and ways that they do it. Uh, but all of them tend to, you know, have, have had success in, you know, really downward, you know, severe downward pullbacks. And then their tactical enhanced, tactical enhanced return strategies, those try to provide, you know, kind of refer to those as the turbocharger in the car. They're trying to provide a little bit extra return. They're willing to take a little bit extra risk. If your goal is to maximize growth in your portfolio and you have a longer time horizon, these are strategies that we can employ that are going to give you a little bit more, a little extra oomph to help get your portfolio to where it needs to be, or even you know, maybe you can add to, to recover when markets do sell off. The last slide I'm gonna show here is just an example of what our platform looks like today. It is continually evolving. We've not, you know, and, and John has used a number of the strategies on our platform here. Um, he doesn't use every, you know, every strategy, but there's some well-known names that you're gonna see. American Funds, BlackRock, JP Morgan, Double line, but there's also names that you're not going to be very familiar with. Julex Capital, Model Capital, um, Dimensional Funds. You know, while you know some clients know who they are, other clients may never have heard of them because they, they're another firm that does not sell to the retail investor currently. Um, so the two examples I'm going to talk about is one in our limit loss space, <clears throat> Model Capital, and one in our our bond alternative space, uh, Nasdaq Dorsey Wright. So to start with model capital, model capital is a strategy that historically, when markets are calm, when everything is going great, they're 100% allocated to the U.S. equity market. They're typically allocated uh, towards sectors in the S&P, and they use fundamental analysis uh, to, to determine that allocation. They're looking at investor sentiment. They're looking at valuations in the markets. Uh, you know, they're looking at a lot of fundamental data to determine what is going on, how they want to position their portfolio. But that same fundamental data in J or sorry, November of 2019 caused them to see a forward-looking outlook on the, on the markets that was going to turn negative. So they decided to move their portfolio based on that data 100% to short-term treasuries. They weren't too thrilled with the bond space, so they moved to treasuries in November 2019 and have stayed there ever since. They actually moved a little bit in uh, April into high yield bonds then moved back out. But because of that, by the end of March, when the market had, was at its bottom, I think the peak to trough was the S&P 500 was down 35%. Model was actually up uh, about two and a half to 3% net of all fees. That is a great portfolio to have in your allocation that prevents you, you know, prevents the investor, prevents the advisor from making decisions to move their portfolio 100% to cash or make a change. You have a strategy in there that's doing this on your behalf based on fundamental data. And then when the time comes and they start to see that fundamental data in the economy and investor sentiment start to change and start to look a little bit better, they're able to re, you know, rebuy into their equity strategy. They could start by adding 50% into equities. They could eventually go, you know, they could go right back to 100% equities, but it's a strategy that does this based on data not based on emotion. The second one I'll talk about, NASDAQ Dorsey Wright. 
Uh, you'll probably know the NASDAQ name. Dorsey Wright is a uh, fixed income analysis firm that also manages investment portfolios. And the way they manage portfolios is with they're doing 100% fixed income, but they're using uh, technical analysis to manage price trends in different sectors of fixed income. So when everything is normal, and actually where they're at today for the fixed income space is actually very normal, NASDAQ Dorsey Wright will be allocated to six different ETFs that track different sectors of the fixed income space, high yield bonds, emerging market debt, short-term and long-term treasuries, corporate fixed income, and floating rate bonds. However, what happened in February of this year, based on what was going on in the market environment in fixed income, they moved 40% of their, they moved 100 or 60% of their allocation in, you know, this is the high yield, the emerging market bond sector, corporate bonds moved out to short-term treasuries, and they stayed, they kept their 40% long-term bond exposure. How did this work? They were up year to date through March of, thir March of this year, they were up uh, 5% net of fees. Because of the change in the fixed income landscape and having that long-term fixed income position, when investors uh, worldwide were moving away from equities and buying bonds, they were moving towards the short end of fixed income, uh, where they wanted to move to short end of fixed income, but there was no yield. The long end of fixed income started to get a little bit more purchasing opportunity, and that's what benefited Dorsey Wright. However, in March, they started to make a move to, or sorry, in April, they made a move back into the corporate bond space, and then in May, they added back their high yield and emerging market exposure. So, based on these price trends, they've been able to make some very tactical changes to help you from a fixed income standpoint. So you're not just sitting in one portfolio that's just waiting for things to happen. You're able to make some different change. You know, you have a portfolio that's making changes in and out of different fixed income set, fixed income sectors to help your portfolio have a, a little bit more um, maneuverability. And with that, I'll, I'll turn over my time. You know, I think that that, that covers who Asimark is. I think it covers you know, gives a good example of what we're doing at Asimark from an investment belief standpoint. And uh, John, I'll open up for uh, Q and A. If there's anything you want to ask me? All right, Excellent. Daniel's collecting the questions. Uh, that was a good start. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it, uh, Patrick. And so, let's. What kind of questions do we have so far, Daniel? And like I say, folks, feel free to ask questions because they uh, they keep us on our toes, and we want to make sure we address what concerns you. By the way, everyone, uh, you can ask questions. Bye. <laughs> Q either the Q&A button in question. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah, you're okay, you can hear me? there. Okay. Sorry about that. Internet's uh, going in and out today for some reason. Yep. <clears throat> John, first question, first question for you, given the, given the big gains in the market recently, where are we going from here? <laughs> well, uh, we, we, it's like every other game, and some people get offended when you say it's a game. I think life's a game, and you know, we got to figure out the rules and, and maybe sometimes we play by them, sometimes we break them. But if we kind of have a sense for what the rules are, we might be able to play the game and enjoy it. So what I like to say is uh, we want to enjoy as much of the melt up as we possibly can as we simultaneously prepare for a meltdown. Now, let me go back a little bit because I was on uh, national news programs interviews starting in December where the question was about, uh, is a recession going to happen? And w we, as investors, you know, there's a lot of fear. And some of the words we don't like are math and budgeting and recession, oh my goodness, and depression. But you know what I'm gonna say to you is embrace all of those words. Let's understand them. I mean, if, if you knew there was gonna be a 7.6 earthquake tomorrow, is that good news, bad news? It's just news. But if you're prepared for it, you might be able to tell the story, yes? We want you to be able to tell the story. So just as we uh, are enjoying the melt-ups and they make you feel very good and they make you feel very smart, let's recognize that the reverse also has the reversal in, in impact. The declines don't make you feel good, they make you feel bad and they make you feel kind of stupid. So in December, I said that uh, I thought the chances of a recession were about 20%. In January, I increased those odds from what I could see to about 80%. And in February, we raised the odds to 100%. Now, some folks don't recognize that we are in, as I say, a full-blown recession. And the interesting thing about a recession is you don't typically see it coming. 
because you can't count it until you've had two quarters of negative gross domestic product. Well, we are now in the second quarter. So we're definitely in a recession. Could it uh, blossom? I'm saying act as if. Uh, depression too is in the cards. Act as if. Now keep in mind, because oh my God, we don't want, uh, stop it. <laughs> okay, smile, breathe, and say, and recognize. On a per capita basis, our research team uh, did research, reminds us that on a per capita basis, Americans in the Great Depression, more Americans became millionaires than any other time in history. I see that as good news, but you're not going to become better off by having more debt. If you're corporate, necessarily, if you're an individual or for government, okay, we're going to talk more about this because I think it's going to blow up all over the world. So I'm saying act as if depression too is in the cards. Do not try to protect equities, no matter what kind of equity it might be. This might be a good time, in fact, to get some money off the table to uh, capture the, those gains that you've enjoyed, wherever they might be, because uh, the only way I can imagine that people became millionaires during the Great Depression, number one, is they had cash. Maybe that's where we came up with the philosophy, cash is king, I don't know. But you, you can recognize if it's going to be a business that uh, the value drops uh, 60% and you can buy it after that value has dropped, God bless you or a piece of property that drops 40 to 50%, or the stock market that has dropped, uh, we've seen 80, 89%. Could the next decline be 70%? I'm just giving you some numbers that kind of make sense to me. So uh, right now, I think we might be in a, in a bear market trap. And let's, history is another one of those words we're not fond of. But Daniel and I study history, thank goodness the research team makes us or they give us information and we have to look at it. And one of the things that really, that, that certainly gets our attention is we can see in uh, Depression One, there was a, uh, a bounce of about a 50% gain. And it held for six months. But that was in the middle of a 30 month decline in some reports, 80%, and other reports, 89%. Now, for my peers that always want to tell you, the market always comes back, this is true. But please keep this in mind. If you're an adult in the early 1900s, the life expectancy was mid-50s. So if you're an adult in the 1900s, uh, I imagine you had to be an adult to have any money in the stock market. Uh, yeah, the market did come back. In some reports, it was 20 years. In other reports, it was 25 years, assuming two things. One, you didn't sell your shares, and two, you didn't take out any money. <laughs> I can't imagine those, that one-two punch being something that most of us did back then. And, and this is, I think, maybe even the more important point, and that is the life expectancy for those born in the early 1900s was mid-50s. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that submits to me that, yeah, the market came back long after we were dead. And I will tell you, uh, studying that kind of uh, experience is something that re <coughs> excuse me, really motivates me. I do not want to be a part of that. I do not want you to be a part of that. But if we don't learn from history and recognize how things might turn and prepare for the worst and hope for the best, it's not uncommon to wake up to an aha moment and, you know, or an OS moment. And of course, that stands for oh shucks, right? Stay tuned, but be prepared. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you John. <clears throat> Excuse me, Patrick, next question for you. How does asset market get paid? How does asset market get paid? So asset market charges a platform fee uh, on top of the advisor fee. That cover, but that fee covers the strategist that I showed. It covers custody, covers trading, covers reporting. We bundle that all into one platform fee along with the advisor's advisor fee into one fee that comes is deducted from the account on a quarterly basis. And Do you know what the average is, Miller? Well, Patrick, maybe you can address that, Daniel, from our side. Patrick, I want to make sure we uh, talk about uh, transaction fees, which uh, in mutual funds and exchange traded funds, as you know, and most of us don't, those are fees that you typically do not see in the prospectus. So people think they're seeing all the fees. They're seeing the report, but they're not seeing all the fees. So, 
speak to that, Daniel, um, uh, Patrick, please, and then Daniel, I think you could probably address that question real well. Yeah, so, and what I would say with, with regard to Asmark, you know, we have, we have switched over. Everything that we do is institutional uh, share classes or ETFs. We're doing everything we can to do the lowest possible share class when, op when there's an option or an option to. Uh, the reason by doing that is we want to, you know, while there are internal expenses to every mutual fund or ETF to run those underlying investments, we want to make sure that those fees are as little as possible. So the fees that you're seeing are as transparent, you know, we're as transparent as possible. You see about all the fees that you're going to see uh, come out on your statement. That help what you're looking for, John? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And as a, a summary, Daniel, you would say, where's the, give us a range, because I mean, it does go down as the account size goes up. If we're talking about exchange traded funds, there's there's really not any internal fees. Uh, mutual funds range any for anywhere from from 0.15 percent to two percent, or four or five percent on the real on the really high side. But it's typically around one percent additional cost per year. And and let me speak to it from a, a larger issue uh, to the audience, please. And this was a position that we were uh, talking to after 2008 who used one of the uh, funds that you're familiar with because they do a lot of advertising and they've suggested that passive is the way to go. Index funds are the only thing to own and, and you need to be as cheap as possible. And so this gentleman, this physician with about $3 million said, well, you know, I'm paying about 1%. I said, well, uh, let's hold that to be true just for the sake of having a conversation. And let's suppose we charge 2%. He said, oh my goodness, that's so expensive. I go, well, that's true. Let's agree that you, or I'm gonna agree with you. However. Let's look at it from the, the standpoint of your bottom line. So if we had $3 million and the market's off 37% and your account, sir, was off 42%, let's just stop at 40 just to make the math a little simpler. That's what, 3 million minus 40, that's minus 1.2. At the end of the year, you're left with 1.8 from your $3 million after being off over 40%. Uh, if we were in a situation where, let's say, the losses were limited to 20% instead of your in excess of 40%, so 20% from $3 million is what, minus 600,000, which leaves you at the end of the year, what, 2.4 million? If we look at 2.4 million versus 1. Point, so what do we have, 1.8 million, that's about a $600,000 difference to your bottom line. So, I, you know, the, my friend, the good doctor, I, I don't want to be flippant, but you know, sometimes we actually get what we pay for. And let's recognize that the passive position is more docile. The active position is more active. People are looking at your account daily. So that should be more expensive, but at the end of the day, you ended up with more money, which is where I live, okay? But you know, the, to me, they, there should be some compensation for people or companies that put in systems that don't just say sit and take it. They start maybe your account with 5% cash at the beginning of January of 08, but by a year in um, 2008, it's 62, 70 to maybe even in some cases 100% cash. Automatically, we didn't have to call you, we didn't have to track you down, life's busy, you've got things going on, a lot of moving parts right now. So to the extent that the system, the the technology, you know, the strategies are built into how the money's managed, regardless of whether or not Peter Lynch or John Grace or Daniel Bethina or Patrick is, is around, the, the, the company is doing the work for you. And, and the question that they're asking every day, that's what we hold them to, is it risk on or risk off? Are we, is it appropriate to put coal on this fire or water? You know, if it's a melt up, pour on the coal. If it's a meltdown, get the water. <laughs> let's put this fire out and let's limit our losses. You, I mean, think of it this way. In, in judo, right? Matthew and Mark, I had to go to judo classes with them. And the, one of the first things you recognize or you learn in judo, it's not about trying to flip the other person. It's about learning how to fall so that you can tell the story, so that you can get up the next day, <laughs> right? And so you get up off the floor after you fall. That's what we're trying to do is, is limit the hurt on the fall so we can stay engaged to, you know, be at it a, another day. Excellent. Last question, then we'll start wrapping up. Patrick, could you give an example of what the alternative strategies are doing? 
So uh, I'll start with, I'll talk about some of the managed future strategies. Um, I, I'm going to use the term managed futures, although it's a little bit of a, you know, it's something that you don't see a lot of use of in the retail space. Typically, it is used more in the high net worth space. You have to be an accredited investor, but now there are ways to use that through mutual fund. Um, these are strategies that can kind of do anything. They can go into equities. They can go, you know, domestically or internationally. They can also take short positions where they're actually betting the invest the market's going to fall. They can all they can go to fixed income or anywhere in between. They've got a wide range. The last that I looked, a lot of the managed future strategies had still been sitting 100% in long-term fixed income. Uh, but they have the ability to move very quickly. So I haven't seen all the data through the end, you know, the last that I've seen is through the end of May, uh, but those do, those positions do update uh, rather quickly. So in the next few days, I'm probably gonna get something through the end of June, see where things are, where, where they're positioned. But um, the managed future strategies that we're using most often have still been invested 100% in long-term fixed income. Excellent. Thank you very much. And John, what do we got going on next week? We have something else going on next week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we do this every week, folks. And as I say, your input helps us discover and determine what we should we should line up. Uh, I talked about the economy first and say some things that it, it, it's a, for us. It's been a good practice to kind of embrace this whole uh, nobody else is doing what you're seeing us do here right now. Uh, I'm talking about our peers. Uh, because, I mean, the, the news programs, they're great in terms of, you know, they're huge. They're very fast. And it's four or five minutes. I mean, that's all. You, you can't get into the, uh, an understanding in four or five minutes and you're off to a commercial break and you're off to the next news breaking program. So, uh, like I say, keep your uh, thoughts and, and suggestions in terms of what you want us to cover. And we'll see what we can do to uh, put it on the docket. So we talk about the economy first and some news that we think you can actually use despite whatever you're hearing in the headlines, it's not telling the whole story. And then we bring in a speaker like Patrick or last week, uh, we had a, a great time, um, you know, looking at, uh, what were we talking about last week, Daniel? Uh-oh, we lose our sound. Sorry, my internet's going in now, can you hear me? Yes. Pat, we had our panel discussion on uh, racial inequality. Of course we did, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and we had a really good time with the uh, one lady from Houston who helped us understand how Houston did better in the recent riots than did Dallas, according to her. And she talked about white supremacy, which is something that we're learning more about, all of us. And then we had a uh, retired LA County Sheriff Department help us see how these police departments work very differently across the country. And probably now is a good time for us to have some similarities, if not some consistency across the board of 18,000 police departments in America. So next week we'll be having a good friend of ours, uh, an attorney to recognize how employees can be retained and how employers can retain high quality uh, employees during, particularly during the pandemic. And then on the 15th, uh, we're gonna be having a good client of ours who has not been afraid to budget, has budgeted successfully and will help us recognize that that's something that uh, well-to-do people are in the practice of doing, budgeting, they're not afraid of the word, they're not afraid, afraid of the habit, and how many of us can develop better habits by doing more budgeting or better budgeting and keeping our eye on exactly, how do we keep the expenses here and the income there? How do we do that? What, what do we, but if we're unconscious, you know, it gets uh, cattywampus uh, uh, very quickly. So yeah, please join us and please feel free to give us your feedback. We'll be sending you some information. And as I say, if you have trouble with the second piece where you're filling in the blanks, uh, let us know and we'll give you a call and walk you through it so that you can answer the questions and you can get your answer. It's a personal answer. Uh, and uh, we wish you the, you know, the best 4th of July ever, no matter how you get to spend it, might be looking at past 4th of July's, right? <laughs> as opposed to this one, which might not be very memorable or maybe memorable in another way. Uh, but, uh, you know, as Peter Lynch says, know what you're doing with your money and know what your money is doing. And we wish you a um, happy 4th of July. Uh, may God bless America. May God bless you. We'll see you next week.